Chapter Eleven. Sand trapped. My problem, my great fear. Think about it from my perspective. The beach is made out of sand. My wheelchair only comes with two-wheel drive, and it sure isn't a doom buggy. See where I'm going with this? Of course you do. I wouldn't be able to budge. I'd sink. I'd be like Han, Leia, and Luke in Star Wars: Return of the Jedi. Stuck on the endless expanse of the Tatooine desert, waiting for some sand creature to come along and suck me down into its sand pit for dinner, or maybe just a snack. To me, the beach is just a desert surrounded by water you can't drink. I'd be stranded in my wheelchair as it slowly sank deeper and deeper. No water, no sunblock. I can't go on. <coughs> It'd be horrible. Plus, I'd have sand in my socks, probably my underpants too. Chapter Twelve. There is nothing finer than Saturday at the diner. Next stop, up the boardwalk a couple of blocks to Frankie's Good Eats by the Sea. My uncle's diner is always packed on Saturdays, so sometimes I lend a hand, helping out behind the cash register. The best part. I get to tell a joke to every single person I ring up. Here's your change, Mrs. P. And how about a little Rodney Dangerfield for dessert? The woman smiles. She's a real sweetheart. Okay. I tug at my collar like Rodney would. I tell you, I come from a stupid family. During the Civil War, my great uncle fought for the West. Mrs. P. cracks up. The next guy steps up to my register and hands me his guest check. He's one of my regulars, Mr. Amelito. Delivers newspapers house to house. What have you got for me, Jamie? Make me laugh. I make his change first: fifty-three cents and some classic George Carlin. Excellent. Say, can vegetarians eat animal crackers? Hey, how do they get the deer to cross at the yellow road sign? I put a dollar in a change machine. Nothing changed. He's laughing so hard he almost swallows his toothpick. So I work in a little of my own material. If number two pencils are so popular, why are they still number two? Mr. Emilito is still cracking up. Who does that one? He asks. Carlin? Nope, that one's mine. Really? Awesome. And he tosses his fifty-three cents into the tip cup that Uncle Frankie keeps on the counter. Wow, I think I just became a professional comedian. You know, says Uncle Frankie, you've got a gift, Jamie. Really? Did it come with a gift receipt? Because I've had my eye on an iPod, Jamie. Can you maybe be serious for two seconds? Ah,、uh, I can try. Good. I saw this in the paper. You should enter this comedy contest. Think about it. I've seen you with the customers, kiddo, and with Joey Gaynor and Jimmy Pierce. Says Uncle Frankie, "You're hysterical. You could win. Seriously." I disagree. Seriously. One, I don't think I'm funny enough. Not even close. Two, I definitely choke, because I'm a choker. Seriously. Chapter Thirteen, from Russia with Love. Later at the diner, I ring up another regular, an old man named Mister Berdzeki. He's Russian, so I dig deep and pulled out some classic Yakov Smirnoff, from all the way back in the nineteen eighties, like another century. Did you see the ad in the paper this morning, Mister Berdzeki? It said big sale last week. Last week. Why advertise? I already missed it. They're just rubbing it in. He laughs like a happy bear. So I keep going. Yakov Smirnov says that in Russia there were only two TV channels. Channel one was propaganda. Channel two was a KGB officer telling you turn back to channel one. Mr. Berdzeki is drying his eyes with a paper napkin. He's a really nice man. You funny boy," he says. "I funny? Da, you're funny. Okay, if he says so, I funny."
Chapter 14. There is no place like home. Seriously, there isn't. Unfortunately, my day at the diner ends, and I have to head for home. Well, it's not really home. I guess I don't really have a home anymore. Before I came to Long Beach, I lived in a small town called Cornwall, where life was definitely good. Tall mountains, deep blue lakes, forests that went on forever. I used to love to go exploring. I'd imagine stories like I was Captain Jack Sparrow and the woods were my pirate hideout. Other times, I'd be the master chief and tear through the forest, pretending it was filled with all the alien creatures from Halo. I'd give anything to go back to the way things used to be, but I can't. I guess none of us ever can, right? So, what happened to make me move to Long Beach and live with the smileys? Nothing I really want to talk about, and I definitely don't want to bore you with the details about how I ended up in this wheelchair. Like I said, it's not really worth it. In fact, it's a total buzzkill. So, you know, enough said. Chapter 15 Home is where the heartless bully is. On the way home, I'm thinking about what Uncle Frankie said about that funny kid contest, and I'm still in the same place. No way. I'd choke. When I finally reached Smileyville, I noticed that the family's road-hogging, gas-guzzling, DVD-playing SUV is gone. So are the Smileys. So I reach into my backpack, fish around inside, and find the remote control garage door opener. I know, most kids have a set of house keys. I have a genie garage door opener from a Home Depot. It's okay. I'm fine with it. Home sweet garage. I aim the remote at the door and wait for the familiar click, whir, and grind of the slowly rising panel door. Only, it doesn't come. So I aim and fire again. I also notice that since the sun went down about 15 minutes earlier, the temperature has plunged, like 20 degrees. My bedroom may be chilly, but at least it's warmer than the driveway. I thumb the remote a third time. The garage door still doesn't budge, so, like most guys, I keep pointing and clicking, thinking that if I stun the door opener with just enough infrared beams, it will magically remember how to work. That's when I hear laughter. Actually, it's more like howling. Stevie's in the living room, leering down at me like a lunatic. He looks like a big baboon who's angry because the zookeepers won't toss him any more bananas. He is also laughing like a hyena. Hey, what's the matter, Jamie? He shouts through the glass. Somebody unplug your door opener? Let me in, Stevie. Not gonna happen, step bro. Come on. What? You think you're special? Use the front door like everybody else. Now he laughs even harder. I would go around to the door on the side of the garage, but Uncle Smiley deadbolted it shut for security purposes when I moved in. He also didn't give me a key. Have I mentioned how clueless my adoptive parents are? Oh, I did? Good. Just checking. Meanwhile, the temperature keeps dropping. Have a nice night, bro, Stevie cries from the window and then disappears, leaving me to freeze in peace. Great. I've always loved popsicles. I just never wanted to turn into one. Chapter 16. Me and my crazy friends. Yes, the other smileys finally came home, and yes, my body finally thawed out. Now I know how a bag of frozen broccoli feels. On Monday morning, it's back to school time, which is fine by me. School means I get to hang with my friends, at least. I meet up with Pierce and Gaynor in the schoolyard. Pierce is so smart, he could probably teach the teachers. Did you know, he says, that the average lifespan of a major league baseball is seven pitches? No, I say. I did not know that. It's true, and it's rumored that Coca-Cola was originally green. After Pierce hits me with a few fun facts, 
I try to return the favor with a fresh math joke. So, how come calculus and girls are the same? I don't know, says Pierce. How come? Because I don't understand either one. Speaking of girls, says Gaynor, have I mentioned that Gaynor is girl crazy? I think the nose ring short circuited something in his brain. All he ever wants to talk about is girls. Probably because he's afraid to talk to them. Aren't we all? Well, probably not if you're a girl, but ugh, oh, never mind. I'm thinking about getting Susie Orolsky's name tattooed on my knuckles, Gaynor announces. Who's she, I ask? That girl in physics, says Pierce. You know, Jamie. The one you're always gawking at. I don't know who or what he's talking about. So what do you guys think, says Gaynor, holding up both his fists. I could put one letter on each finger. Bad idea, I say. Everybody will think you're in love with S-U-Z-I-E-O-R-O. Gaynor gets it finally. Oh, man, I need to fall in love with a girl who has a way shorter name. Like, hmm, Meg Chu. She's cool. Like I said, Gaynor is girl crazy. Or maybe he's just plain wacko. Either way, I love the guy. I'm tempted to ask my friends what they think of Uncle Frankie's idea. Me trying out for the funny kid contest. But I don't ask. Know why? Because I choke on the words. Chapter 17. The Biggest Loser. By now you know I love to tell jokes. But other people, it seems, love to play jokes, especially on me. This is why I have such a terrible time at school that day. Maybe the worst since I got to Long Beach. Those two jokesters, Pierce and Gaynor, somehow managed to get my name on the student council ballot. There's a checkbox next to it and everything, so now I'm officially running to be a class representative. They even made posters and hung them in the halls. Yes, my total humiliation has gone totally public. Why would you guys do something so dumb? I ask them when we meet up again in the cafeteria for lunch. Dumb, says Pierce. Pool, you're the best man for the job, Jamie. I am not. Yeah, you are, says Gaynor. You're honest. You say what you mean. You've got guts. Jamie, says Pierce, the student council would be lucky to have you. You have an excellent sense of humor, which can be useful during heated debates. Wow. Maybe my two best friends were serious about me running for office. That made me feel pretty good, actually. For like four hours. Until the announcements at the end of the day. They read the election results. I got three votes. Three out of 361. I know Gaynor and Pierce voted for me, but I can't figure out who the third vote came from. The only thing I know for sure is it wasn't me. I swear, I did not vote for myself. In fact, I voted for a writing candidate, Bart Simpson. Now he's funny. Bart Simpson would be great on the student council. Bart Simpson could be the planet's funniest kid comic, too. It's definitely not me. Chapter 18. The Crip from Cornball. The funny thing is, I used to be ready to try anything. I had no fear. Maybe I should have, though. Like I said... I used to live in a small town called Cornwall in upstate New York. Well, that's what people who live there call it, and the people who make maps. Stevie Cosgrove, he calls it Cornball, making me the crit from Cornball. Seems before I moved to Smileyville, Stevie had his eye on the garage. I wanted that to be my bedroom, he says. It'd be so easy to sneak out at night to TP yards, egg cars, and punch people. Yes, Stevie has an active social life. He also shadows me wherever I go. School, the bathroom, <laughs> the movies. And don't think I won't punch you, he's always saying. You already did punch me. I want to remind him, but I never do. Because it might make him mad enough to punch me again. 
I'll punch anybody and anything, he boasts. Girls, old people, fire hydrants, even goldfish. Yes, Stevie Cosgrove claims he actually punched out a goldfish once. When he was a baby with teeny tiny fists. I didn't like the way the thing was looking at me with that sideways eyeball, so I smacked it right in the kisser. And unlike the miniature snack crackers, this goldfish did not smile back. Chapter 19. My Lunch Date The next day at lunch, I make my way to our usual table in the far corner of the cafeteria and discover that Pierce and Gaynor have invited someone new to join our crew, the girl with the frizzy hair. Hey, Jamie, says Gaynor. You know Gilda Gold, right? From math class. She's a girl. Gilda's in my robotics club, adds Pierce. She told me she likes those jokes you crack all the time from the back of the room. So I invited her to join us for lunch so she could officially meet you. I'm nodding and staring and saying something like stammer, uh, stammer, stammer, uh, stammer. Or maybe it's a humana, 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 which is what the old-time TV comedian Jackie Gleason used to jabber whenever he choked. Whatever I do, it makes Gilda giggle. She thinks I'm trying to be funny. I bet you say that to all the girls, she says, giving me her bubbly laugh, which gives me enough confidence to get out. Usually I say something like, haven't I seen you someplace before? And then they say, yeah, that's why I don't go there anymore. Gilda laughs and then flings me her own comeback joke. Yesterday, this total jerk actually asked me what my sign was. I told him, no parking. Now it's my turn to laugh, and suddenly it's like we have this whole history between us, even though we don't. Just math class. And a love of jokes, I guess. Gaynor and Pierce slide down to the end of the table to play flick football. Gilda Gold and I crack open our chocolate milk cartons and talk like crazy. She tells me how she moved to Long Beach from New England. I tell her a little bit about Cornwall. She loves baseball, especially the Boston Red Sox. Even though wearing a Bo Sox hat is lethally dangerous this close to New York City, Long Beach is diehard Yankees territory. I tell her how I used to love playing baseball, center field, then I realize what I'm getting into, and I stop myself. Now I mostly play DVDs of old movies, I say. I love old movies, Gilda gushes. Comedies? Definitely. Blazing Saddles and Airplane. And anything with Will Ferrell. What about the Marx Brothers, I ask? I love those guys. I pick up my milk straw and start doing my best Groucho impersonation. Hello? Room service? Send up a larger room. Gilda giggles. I keep going. Outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. And that's when Stevie Cosgrove shows up. His fist has some kind of brown goop smeared on it. I think he just punched somebody's bean burrito. Why are you wearing that hat, he says to Gilda. Um, because I like the socks. Cosgrove cocks back his arm. Consider this a warning, sister. You better watch yourself. Okay, sure. Gilda pulls out her makeup mirror, stares at her reflection. I'm watching myself. When Cosgrove stomps away, it's Gilda's turn to quote some Groucho to me. He may look like an idiot and talk like an idiot, but don't let that fool you. He really is an idiot. Yep, she funny. Chapter 20. Why public speaking should be called public execution. I wish I could say that after lunch with Gilda and the guys, my day just kept getting better and better. I guess if this were a Hollywood movie, that's how things would go. Unfortunately, it's just my life. Right after lunch, I have ELA, English Language Arts. One of those arts, I hate to say, is public speaking. And it's my turn to give a speech. I chose the topic, Climbing Mount Everest. Why not? Fiction is one of the language arts, too. 
Today, I say when I'm in front of everybody, I'd like to talk to you about climbing Mount Everest, the mountain which Tibetans call Jung Malunga, a name that means Holy Mother. And that's exactly what I said the first time I saw the summit looming in the distance. Holy Mother, what have I gotten myself into this time? The class and Mrs. Kanai, our teacher, laugh. But it had always been my dream to reach the top of the world, as Everest, the highest mountain peak on Earth, is sometimes called. However, I had been hoping that Donald Trump would just drop me off in his helicopter, but it wasn't meant to be. The Donald was busy making another couple of billions that day. Why Everest, you may ask? Because it's there is the most famous answer. There was nothing good on TV is another. More laughs. And so with my trusted Sherpa guide and a sled dog named Bob, I set out from Kathmandu. We made our way to base camp and spent two weeks adjusting to the higher altitude and lack of oxygen. We all sounded like we'd been sucking helium out of a birthday balloon. Finally, we set out for the summit. Yes, it was hard. Yes, it was dangerous. Yes, we had to wear helmets that gave us horrible hat hair. But it was worth it, because I knew that if I could ascend Mount Everest, I would show the world that I could overcome any obstacle life put in my way. I could achieve any dream I dreamed. And so I pushed myself. Literally. I mean, I used both arms and pushed. Hard. That Everest is steep. Suddenly, an unexpected storm erupted. Thunder boomed. Snow swirled all around me. My wheels became caked with ice. My spokes became icicles. My Sherpa guide and Bob the sled dog both said we should turn back. But I said no. I could see the summit. I could. Actually, what I see are two dozen pairs of eyeballs staring at me. My audience is dying to hear how my story ends. And then a real storm erupts. A sweat storm. My armpits look like I've been popping water balloons down there. I can't remember how the speech is supposed to end. All of a sudden, I have a new dream. To disappear right into the floor. Chapter 21